Thank you, uh, McWitch, and uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear, hear me all right uh, now. Now that we have this new microphone, um, well, what, welcome back, and uh, Buju. Uh, to, to those of you who, who weren't able to make that the first session, um, the second one will we'll build on that one uh, a, a little bit, uh, but uh, there'll be new information a, a, a as well. I, I did want to note uh, before I dove into this history, um, I, it, it will be covering a, a traumatic events, and uh, we never quite know how that will affect us as as we engage in, in this history. Uh, sometimes perfectly fine, and other times stories hit us and, and strike us in, in new ways. And so I, I hope everyone takes care of themselves as we carry through this history. We will be talking about massacres. We will be talking about genocide. We will be talking about uh, the boarding schools and forced uh, assimilation. And I want to be cognizant of some of the dangers when we're talking about this history. Not only this, these events themselves, but as uh, viewing trauma for trauma's sake. Um, that's not what I'm attempting to do here. I think it's important to not shine away from, from this history. I think that it connects from what we were talking about in the previous lecture and the foundations uh, with the Dis Doctrine of Discovery and US federal Indian law to see what changes come during the 19th century. Last time I also talked about, well, why do we bother studying history? Um, I often ask this uh, of my students when, when they come into my classes. And one of the analogies I, I made last week was this idea of, of a building and history as, as blueprints uh, within that building. We kind of bump around. We don't quite know why, why something exists in, in the way that it does. But history, history can be those blueprints of, of a house and it can show us where these systemic uh, issues lie. Um, I often require my students to think, well, after we learn about this history, where are we supposed to go from here? And that was kind of my meditation uh, as I was bringing this lecture together. So as, as a recap um, from, from earlier th this month, and, and if you were unable to, to make the first session, wanted to note this idea of history as serving as these blueprints of, of our society. Um, systemic injustices, uh, they are coming out of a longer history. And so I began with this idea, this concept of the indigenous borderlands between the Dakota and the Anishinaabe. And I also spoke about the woman who married the beaver and that this Dakota Anishinaabe relationship takes on this, this mimicking of the treaty relationship of the woman who married the beaver. And of course, that story is, is about an Ojibwe woman who is, is fasting and comes across this man who ends up marrying her. And it turns out that he happens to be a, a, a beaver. She, she does not recognize this until he passes. And from this, she understands this relationship that this being is trying to have with the Ojibwe. It is a reciprocal relationship that's built on respect. And in a similar manner, the Anishinaabe were supposed to build their own treaty negotiations with other tribes um, on this reciprocal, this refreshing of the relationship that has to be revisited constantly. And so then I noted that Euro-Americans who come into this space, well, they're seeking to break and change that relationship. They're using Eurocentric ideas, really white supremacist ideas that include this doctrine of, of discovery, an idea that all this land that they're coming on, if it's not owned, quote unquote, by a, a white man, then it's open, it's free to obtain, and particularly if those who are living upon that land are not Christian. And this becomes embedded in U.S. Uh, federal Indian policy. We see Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall. He is further redefining what U.S. and indigenous nations relationship is going to look through through a series of three cases called the Marshall Trilogy. And these occur in the 1820s and 1830s. The first that only the federal government can purchase land from native nations. This is based out of this doctrine of discovery. 
uh, essentially the U.S. federal government has the right of first refu refusal through their inheritance of land claims um, after their defeat of the British. Then the second case, we see another definition of this relationship, the idea that tribes are domestic dependent nations in that they are not quite the equals uh, of the federal government, but they are separate. And that, that, that has some odd meanings. We're not entirely sure what, 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 what that means. There needs to be no more clarification. So Marshall has this third case and in it in, in 1832, he rules that state law has no impact in what they were terming Indian country unless Congress allowed it to have some impact. This further complicates this relationship. So tribes have some sovereign power that state law cannot interfere with, but the federal government has an ultimate uh, authority. And these three cases, they, they kind of sit juxtapositioned uh, against e each other, and they add these complications um, to what, what extends out from the 19th century through the 20th and into our own 21st century. This was the first, the first series of lectures exploring, well, what does that relationship look like? It's this treaty relationship that is changing into a commodified one. The United States is attempting to bring its own ideas of private property, but really what it means to live a good life and enforce it on indigenous people. So we move into tonight, and I wanted to start with the United Nations definition of genocide. And there are five parts to this definition of genocide, and we will be going through each one of them by the time we make it to the third lecture. That is killing the members of a group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group, and forcibly transferring children out of the group to another group. Now, this definition, this is uh, this comes into being after World War II. It is a passed by the United Nations in, in 1946. But these terms, these definitions have been applied looking backwards at a series uh, of events, uh, including relations between indigenous peoples and the United States. And I, I don't think it will be a, a surprise that in each uh, of these clauses, um, the action has been undertaken against indigenous people in all five of the forms of genocide. The United Nations Commission of Experts also looked at international humanitarian law uh, following the war in, in Yugoslavia and, and Serbia. And they were looking at this other definition of well, what would be an ethnic cleansing. And they defined it as rendering an area ethnically homogeneous by using force or intimidation to remove persons of a given groups from an area. A purposeful policy designed by one ethnic or religious group to remove by violent or terror inspiring means the civilian population of another ethnic or religious group from certain geographical areas. And so we're, we're leaving off from the previous lecture, this moment in 1830, uh, right around the time of the Marshall Trilogy where the United States is passing such acts like the Indian Removal Act. It in clear looking back on this, this is an attempt of not only genocide, but ethnic cleansing uh, of the American South uh, East, as well as the Midwest. This sets up the Trail of Tears um, and a flood of treaty making within the Great Lakes itself. Closer to home in Wisconsin and Minnesota, we see a series of treaties, uh, those with the Ojibwe and with the Dakota. Um, and often we see this series of, of treaties operating in bad faith negotiations. We have everything from Pike's Treaty in 1805 with the Dakota to the Prairie du Chien Treaty in 1825, uh, Ojibwe treaties in 1837, 1842, 54, 55, and 67. And that brings me to tonight's opening because we, we often focus on these massive uh, events, uh, the U.S. Dakota War in 1862. But there's another one that comes ahead of it that is less often talked about within Minnesota, and that's the events that happen uh, during the Sandy Lake tragedy. So some people call the Sandy Lake uh, tragedies the Sandy Lake incident, uh, the ethnic cleansing uh, of Sandy Lake, 
uh, the majority of historians ha have settled on um, Sandy Lake tragedy. And what happens in it has everything to do with these treaties and the negotiations and the lack of good faith that are being involved in these treaties. So Wisconsin's non-native population in the 1840s, it, it was uh, very limited. And the federal government at this time in, in Wisconsin was not focused on removing non uh, removing the Ojibwe from, from Wisconsin. Uh, they were turning their attention to places like uh, Indiana, uh, Illinois, uh, Georgia were, were priority lo locations. Wisconsin was further north. While there were some timber interests there, there weren't enough settlers for the federal government to get involved. But this was not the case for all the officials in the region. And so we enter Alexander Ramsey. Famously, I'm, I'm talking to you from St. Paul, which sits within Ramsey County. And Alexander Ramsey becomes extremely important to Minnesota history, but he's not born here. He's born on September 8th, 1815 in Pennsylvania. And early on, he joins the Whig Party. And this later on becomes important for his political prospects, as well as the actions that he's going to take in Minnesota. He's elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1843. During the 1848 election, he campaigned vigorously for Zachary Taylor, who ended up winning and becoming president of the United States. Less than a year later, Taylor appointed Ramsey as the new territorial governor for Minnesota and Ramsey arrives in May of 1849. Now, when he arrives, there are power brokers and merchants within St. Paul who wanted these annuity payments that were coming for, uh, from the treaties to go up through St. Paul, where goods would have to be bought in St. Paul, uh, where perhaps individuals would be coming in into St. Paul and, and spending some of the annuity payments there. And they wanted to pull uh, Ojibwe members from Wisconsin. They wanted to pull Lake Superior Ojibwe bands closer. So they petitioned President Taylor to revoke uh, the treaty rights uh, of the Ojibwe in Wisconsin and begin removing all the Ojibwe from Wisconsin. Now, the Ojibwe rightfully and lawfully uh, objected, the, objected to this. And so Ramsey starts hatching a plan to enforce compliance. And he does this with a newly hired uh, Ojibwe Indian agent named John Watrous. Ramsey first dissolves the Indian agency at La Pointe, and he sets up a brand new agency at Sandy Lake, pulling everybody further down and a little bit closer to St. Paul. Ramsey and, and the agent then decide that they're going to delay the payments. They're going to purposefully delay the payments until late fall. And their thinking was if they delay it till, well, about now, if they delay it till now, the waterways, the trails, they're all going to freeze over. There'll probably be winter storms uh, coming and people won't make the trip back home. They'll, they'll stay close to the Sandy Lake and they'll essentially remove themselves. Well, people did come and they were promised these payments and they started to arrive. And they arrived late in October. What they found was that the Indian agent, he had been further delayed. Uh, the historian Mary Wingret estimates that about 4,000 Ojibwe had arrived by October. And they just sat and they waited for the U.S. government to show up. The agent was still waiting in St. Louis as late as October itself. He was waiting for the payment because the payment from the federal government had been further delayed. And soon... Those Ojibwe who had traveled to Sandy Lake, they began to starve. They were forced to eat the annuity payments, the, the provisions that had uh, already come, some of the early provisions that were on hand. But some of it was rotten, um, and some of it further sickened the people. The Indian agent did not arrive until uh, late November, early December. I've seen about December 3rd is about uh, when, when he arrives. And by that time, disease had been affected almost all the families. Uh, from foodborne illnesses, uh, to measles, uh, to dysentery, uh, to exposure from, from the temporary encampments. And when he does arrive, all he arrives with is non-edible goods. There's no food in order to, to help people continue to survive. The estimates vary, but 
between those who are actually buried at Sandy Lake and those who don't sur survive the return trip home, um, most historians estimate about 400 individuals uh, died. Many children, uh, many elders who, who, who were sick, uh, but it, it was not necessarily discriminatory. Uh, the historian Eric Redex notes that we talk about instances of, of, of massacres, United States military massacres at places like Sand Creek, which, which will happen during the 1860s, and Wounded Knee, which will happen in, in 1890, uh, which killed between two and, and 300 people, importantly, and essentially, we talk about these. But we also have to place an event like the Sandy Lake tragedy as this deliberate attempt to remove and destroy Ojibwe communities into this conversation. It was not a treaty that's built on respect. It's not a treaty that is looking to be uh, reciprocal. This was a targeted action taken by the United States government through its agents in order not only to force a removal of Ojibwe people, but then ensure that their survival was so difficult that they had no other option uh, but to bend to the will of these government agents. I'd like to turn now to Southern Minnesota. And I do wanna talk about the Dakota US War of 1862. And I know that when we talk about these events, we often focus on it being the, well, the result of it, being the largest mass hanging in United States history of the Dakota 38. And that's an important element of, of this, this war. That's an important element uh, of the conflict that, that spreads throughout uh, during the summer of 62. But I think also importantly are the 50 years that lead up to this. And then what happens in the aftermath uh, of that winter day in 1862, because this has everything again to do with the shifting relationship of the United States federal government and indigenous nations. So we start back in 1805. And in 1805, uh, we're in the middle of the United States uh, attempting to explore what, what they see as the West. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is the president in, in DC, and he has sent off Lewis and Clark uh, famously out west on the Missouri River to find a pathway to the Pacific Ocean. Well, he also sends uh, another explorer in, into the north, and that is Lieutenant Zebion Pike. He's going up the Mississippi River. And uh, his goal is no less important to, to the United States. He is uh, attempting to see uh, what kind of animals and plants are there. He is attempting to solidify relations with indigenous nations, and he's also uh, attempting to secure United States federal presence in an area where they're very concerned about French traders and British traders uh, in, in the region. Pike ends up signing treaties along the way, and one of the most infamous ones is the one that he send, signs at Bedote on September 23rd, 1805. There are several uh, Dakota leaders who are present, and it's a little bit unclear on if all these other leaders accepted it or not, because only two individuals actually signed this treaty. Uh, the treaty itself called for the establishment of a military fort, uh, though Pike leaves conveniently blank how much the United States is going to pay. Now, once it's sent to the United States Senate, they decide to essentially pencil in $2,000 which is equivalent to uh, one cent and 28 mail, mills per acre. They then send it off to uh, President Jefferson's desk, but he fails to proclaim this. And that, that's an important element uh, of this treaty is that it's not actually in force if it's not proclaimed. And so there, there are some kind of questions about if it's not officially proclaimed, was it ever in force? What happens is this legacy of unratified and, and shaky treaties. The United States doesn't really have a military presence, a strong military presence throughout the War of 1812. This becomes kind of problematic in the aftermath and they start dusting off these treaties after 1815, uh, looking for some way to establish themselves in the region. And they see Pike's notes and they see that there had been some kind of treaty that had been listed uh, at this confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota uh, rivers. And they say, ah, we should put a fort there. 
that seems to be a strategic location, uh, let's start building. In the meantime, between 1805 and the 1830s, these questions abound uh, because the payment had never actually come uh, for this region. And so we see a series of military commanders attempting to make payments to the Dakota who, who are living there, as well as make new treaties in order to clarify some of this land. We fast forward a little bit to 1851 and the treaties of Traverse de Sioux and Mendota. During this time, um, individuals, including uh, Luke Lea and Henry Sibley, uh, come off from St. Paul uh, to Traverse de Sioux for these negotiations. On June 30th of 1851, Alexander Faribault and the missionary Stephen R. Riggs also arrive, and they're going to serve as interpreters. Their goal was to create a series of, of treaties to obtain Dakota lands uh, to much uh, of, of Minnesota. And throughout this treaty negotiation, throughout this process, they're reading the treaty out loud and reading it in Dakota by Stephen R. Riggs. Now, later historians, including uh, Bruce White and Glenn Westerman, uh, they were able to obtain uh, somewhat uniquely a Dakota written version of the treaty and the United States written version of the treaty. And they start comparing the translations. And what they found are massive problems in, in the translation of language. Uh, one particular uh, grievous case is that the Dakota's understanding looks like it is a lease, that they were not actually selling the land, whereas the English version of, of the treaty clearly states it's a selling, uh, a session of this land. And so there, there's questions, was Riggs uh, just that bad at, at translating the, the, these concepts? Was he doing this on purpose? Um, but the end result is that the Dakota likely did not recognize that they were selling this land in, in 51, that this was some sort of lease agreement. Now, it, it, it further uh, has uh, additional issues during this series of, of negotiations. Um, what would sometimes happen during, during treaties is that uh, fur traders would attend them. And they are part of this whole process of, of a money-making uh, opportunity. In the fall, when a, a fur trader would come to uh, an American agent or a French fur trader, uh, they would receive credit. Uh, a, a Dakota man uh, might be given uh, tools that they need for, for that beaver uh, trapping for, for that season, and they would um, obtain it on credit. And the, the agent would say, don't worry, in the spring, when you come back with your furs, uh, you'll pay it all down. Of course, when the individual came back in the spring, almost by magic, the amount of furs that they brought would never cover their debts. And so these debts would inflate from year to year until they would become so big that the agent would say at the next uh, treaty session, uh, the only way you'll be able to pay this off, off is if you sell some of your land. And so their hands were often the ones open, uh, the first ones open when the federal government came uh, with these treaty secessions and with the payments, they would receive these payments. And this happens during the 1850s with the treaties with the Dakota. Um, what happens after one is that there's an extra document. So the Dakota leaders are going through and they sign the treaty, and then they say, oh, you need to sign this paper as well. And many of them thought, well, they're just signing two copies of the same treaty. When in actuality, this was a secondary document. What this document said is that the Dakota agreed that their payment would go to the traders. Now, this amendment to, to this uh, effect, um, as Bruce White and Glenn Westerman note, uh, even by the standards of the time, this convoluted series of steps that extracted Dakota money appropriated through governmental process, that is payment due via the treaties was tainted. A subsequent Senate investigation in the spring of 1853 revealed many irregularities, providing ample evidence of graft and corruption. Nevertheless, the Senate committee, acting in a political fashion to protect its compatriots, concluded that Ramsey's conduct was not only blameless, but highly commendable and meritorious. These modifications in this 1851 treaty effectively removed the Dakota people from all of their homelands except for this narrow 10-mile strip uh, running for about 140 miles uh, 
And that's what we have in this image here of the lower reservation and upper reservation, lower Sioux and upper Sioux. So it's it's really when we talk about the U.S. Dakota War, we're talking about this 50 years of double dealings uh, that the United States is engaging in. And then we arrive into 1859, 1860, 1861. And these happen to be particularly difficult uh, summers. There are uh, droughts that are going on uh, throughout this time. And by 1862, the, the spring and into the summer of 1862, people are starving. And payments are delayed further because of the American Civil War and that these treaty payments were not a priority. And so people are looking around, what do we do? They come to some of the uh, agents uh, at the forts and ask for payments uh, to come early. Um, but instead, uh, what, what we have is the uh, infamous statement um, from Andrew Jackson Merrick, if, if they are hungry, let them eat grass or their own dung. So this is, uh, this is fermenting uh, across during the summer of uh, 1862. And then we get the story of these young boys. And it's a little bit fuzzy depending on, on, on which source you look at. But as far as we can tell, there are four young Dakota hunters and they come upon this family of, of white settlers. And some say there was a shooting contest and others say that they attacked these. But the end result is that Acton Township, five white settlers are killed by Dakota boys. And these boys run off and they come back um, to their community. And within the community, there's this great debate. What do we do now? Um, and some are arguing, we know the United States is at war with itself. They have their soldiers uh, elsewhere. Now is the time to strike and to push them out. And others say, well, we've married into um, with, with these Americans. We have families with, with these Americans. Um, this will only end poorly. And there are others who want to stay out of it completely. It's massive divisions, um, and it really leads to this misnomer of, of, of Dakota War uh, with so much debate that, that is occurring. The end result is, though, uh, one of the leaders, Little Crow, he agrees to go off and ride and, and to fight. And on August 18th, 1862, Little Crow ends up leading attack at the Lower Sioux Agency. And they end up care killing that Andrew Jackson Merrick. Uh, later on, he, he's found to have uh, grass within his mouth, um, kind of alluding back to that infamous quote that he has. But what takes place then over the next uh, few months is just an inflaming uh, of, of this prairie in, in Minnesota. What I'd like to focus on, there, there's a lot of, of books, there's a lot of notes that, that we could um, look at is this end result. And as many of you know, in the aftermath of this summer long war, uh, eventually the United States uh, sends additional uh, soldiers, uh, people surrender, people are, are rounded up and a series of sham trials uh, results. Uh, over 300 Dakota men are sentenced to death. Now, 260 of these sentences are, are commuted, uh, but the result uh, still occurs of the Dakota 38, the largest mass hanging in United States history occurring uh, the day after Christmas. Now, this is a horrific aspect of Minnesota history. And as horrific as this is, I think some of the other forgotten horror or horror that is uh, pushed to the side is that then also experienced by the Dakota women, Dakota children and elders, who not only had to endure the sight of these trials, who not only had to endure the execution of their loved ones, but for many, many of these non-combatants, they were imprisoned in a concentration camp uh, below Fort Snelling uh, near Pikes Island uh, to today. And then they were forced uh, on a forced journey down the Mississippi uh, along the Missouri River out to the Crow Creek uh, Reservation. They also had to endure a winter uh, at that concentration camp uh, at Fort Snelling, uh, a winter where um, individuals were, were raped uh, at the camp, uh, where individuals came and would shoot into the camp. There are newspaper reports of soldiers joking about having um, missed their target practice, 
and hitting in individuals uh, who were, were, were within this camp as well. And then the horror of being removed out to a reservation where there were very few uh, provisions that were provided uh, later on uh, in 1863. Uh, furthermore, you have um, the terror of, of other indigenous uh, nations at, at this same time, uh, that of uh, the Ho-Chunk, who were neutral during this time. And so very, very briefly, uh, Ho-Chunk -Ho uh, were in, in Wisconsin, uh, they were removed in, in the 1840s and, and 1850s. In 1855, uh, some ha had signed a, a treaty and received lands along the nutrient-rich soil of the Blue River in Minnesota. Well, in the aftermath uh, of the Dakota War uh, in 1862, there is this group called the, the Knights of the Forest. Um, and they, they function like, like the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was also present in Minnesota. Uh, but the Knights of the Forest are, are focused on the, the Ho-Chunk and in, Indigenous people in, in Minnesota. And through a terror campaign and through their petitioning of the United States uh, Congress, they are able, through a special session, uh, to pass a removal bill on February 21st, 1863 that also forced the Ho-Chunk who had been uh, neutral to be removed from their lands. And this is because that land was such a uh, rich farmland and hundreds die on this forced march. Then the story carries on, right? This does not end in, in 62. This does not end with the max ex executions. This does not end with the removal of the Ho-Chunk. It does not end with the removal of the Dakota or the concentration camp at Fort Snelling. It carries on into 1863 and 1864, where expeditions uh, from Minnesota are sent out on horseback. The cavalry is sent into the Dakotas, Dakota Territory, North and South Dakota not nowadays. Um, in order to hunt down uh, individuals, uh, bounties are, are paid uh, for the scalps of Dakota individuals. This is an image of the bounty that's later paid uh, for, for Little Crow. And these uh, attacks, these expeditions, really become precursors to what's known as the quote-unquote Indian Wars that followed the conclusion of the American Civil War uh, through the late 1860s uh, into the 1880s and really uh, culminating in 1890 with the massacre at Wounded Knee. I mean, following, following the U.S.-Dakota War of uh, 1862, even the mere continued presence of indigenous people in Minnesota, that denoted this resistance and persistence. I want to note uh, briefly be, before I move on to, to part three uh, of tonight that this map of, of some of these Western wars that I'm alluding to, um, including the, the Sand Creek Massacre, which, which occurs in, in Colorado. Um, this is kind of setting this, this mindset up uh, where uh, Colonel Shivington uh, is quoted as saying, damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I've come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians, kill and scalp all, big and little, nits make lice. He was under orders not to take any prisoners, and two-thirds uh, of those who, who are scalped are women and children at this event. Um, we see an explosion uh, of warfare in, in the, the 60s, 70s, and, and 80s, um, including uh, Red, Red Cloud War victories at the Hundred in Hand, uh, known as the Featherman's Fight, Battle of Greasy Gra Gla Grass, known as the Battle of Little Bighorn. But the United States engages in this total warfare. It's the same as at the end of the American Civil War, this burning of Atlanta. Uh, they're targeting civilian populations. Uh, they're targeting bison populations. They're targeting women, children, and elders. Uh, they pursue uh, Chief Joseph and the Nez Pierce from their Oregon homelands all the way through uh, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, where they are captured just 40 miles south of the Canadian border and their ultimate grow goal of reuniting with Sitting Bull. They're later rounded up and imprisoned. So this is one direction that the U.S. federal government wants to go. That is in contrast um, 
to what we're going to see next. And so I, I wanted to bring up this uh, definition once again. We have killing members of a group, causing serious bodily, mentally harm of a group, deliberately inflicting the group of conditions life calculated to bring about physical destruction. These are this definition of genocide. Now we'll jump down uh, to point E. Because point E comes from the progressive wing within the US federal government. This will come from uh, Richard Henry Pratt's I I idea of uh, killing the Indian to save the man. So let's start within Canada, uh, because at the same time the United States is engaging in boarding schools, uh, Canada is also engaging in residential schools for First Nations. And so uh, folks may remember um, uh, almost a year and a half ago now uh, at the Kaloops Com uh, Indian Residential School in British Columbia, Canada, 215 First Nation children uh, their remains were found buried in unmarked graves. And since their discovery, hundreds more grave sites have been found at additional schools throughout Canada. Uh, for many non-Indigenous people, these revelations were shocking in, in, in Canada. But for many in the Native community, the unmarked graves, they're, they're no surprise. They have been talking about this. This, this has been uh, within community. They knew that these children would never come home. These results in, in Canada um, are similar in, in the United States, and they have their early roots uh, all the way back to 1819, uh, beginning with the Indian Civilization Fund Act of 1819 that provided money for Christian missionary schools. They were to partner with the U.S. federal government to establish schools for American Indian children. This becomes a for forced uh, assimilation policy later on that blooms into the boarding schools that we know today. Now it's coming in part from the work of, of Richard Pratt. So, so Pratt's a, a Civil War uh, veteran. He had later served with the 10th Cavalry, the famous uh, Buffalo Soldiers, which was a, a unit uh, of, of all, all black soldiers uh, who were used throughout the Civil War, but then used in uh, wars uh, of, of the West as well. And he's charged with fighting a campaign against Southwestern American Indian tribes, including the Cheyenne, the Comanche, the Kawa, the Arapaho, the Apache. Now, during this campaign, Pratt volunteers to bring back prisoners of war. So this is this linkage between these two thoughts in today's uh, lecture. He brings these prisoners of war back to Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida. And this is where the groundwork for the boarding schools are laid. At Fort Marion, Pratt experiments with the forced education policies on these adult prisoners of war. He includes harsh military discipline and enforcement of the use of English and other uh, techniques to coerce the acceptance of white civilization. Despite several prisoners dying in custody due to the unsanitary conditions and to suicides, Pratt argued that his experimentation with this re-education was a success and he lobbies for federal permission to expand his program, which he does at the Hampton Institute of Virginia and later has a dedicated American Indian boarding school established in an old army barracks in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. This becomes the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Here are some of the images that they use to send to their funders in order to demonstrate their quote unquote pro progress. This trauma of American Indian boarding schools is present in Minnesota. There's at least 16 institutions, two of the largest being Morris, um, a school that's first administrated by the Sisters of uh, Mercy Catholic Order and uh, the Pipestone Indian Trading, in Indian Trading School. There hasn't been a full nationwide accounting. They're, they're working on it. The Interior Department is, is working on it, but it's unknown exactly how many students were forced to attend these schools the number is certainly within thousands. Uh, we know, for example, at, at Carlisle between 1879 and 1918, over 10,000 uh, students attended the school and they represented more than 140 tribes. These numbers and these images, when, when I look at them and when I think about them, they start to feel a little bit overwhelming, but I know that they're representing real individuals each one of them has their own personal story. The stories will, will differ, uh, of course, um, 
But I, I think the Zebra Wing Center uh, with the Saginaw Chippewa, they they attempt to describe what what it was like for an individual to arrive at the Mount Pleasant Indiana Industrial Boarding School. And they describe it as such. Children as young as five years of age arrived by car, train, or wagon, and immediately they were told they were dirty Indians. They were stripped and disaffected. They had alcohol, kerosene, or DET, one of the most well-known synthetic pesticides poured on them. And for thousands of children in the late 19th, early, early, early 20th century, this is a representative of the traumatic beginnings that they have at these schools. They are forced uh, to cut their hair, have a new English name, their language is banned. They are forced into this military dress. They have strict uh, discipline, army-like rules. Um, and they're not allowed to see uh, family members. In the summer, uh, some may, may say, well, uh, students then could leave and, and, and go home. A couple more images here um, uh, of the summer work program. Uh, but they had to receive permission uh, to go back home during the summer. And many times it was claimed that if they were to, to leave any progress that was being made, uh, they were afraid uh, would, would regress. And so often uh, students stayed and they were either uh, literally farmed out to area farmers and any wages that they earned were sent back to the school to pay for the school, or they stayed at the school itself uh, to grow food and to continue to work it and uh, clean it uh, so that uh, some of this cost was subsidized by the students themselves. Any student who attempted to resist by running away was often caught, and those who were caught then were um, often severely punished. Uh, sometimes even more insidiously, they would have an older student who would be forced to punish a younger student. There was also uh, sexual abuse that was present at, at, at these schools. Uh, we know better numbers for Canada than we do for the United States. Again, we haven't had a full accounting uh, yet. Um, but uh, at least in, in one uh, Canadian uh, residential school, as they were uh, looking into the reports in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Report from Canada noted that from the 19th century onward, uh, governments and churches did recognize that there were individual staff members who might sexually abuse residential school uh, students. Uh, for example, in 1886, Jean Le Hooks, who was a translator and recruiter, for a Roman Catholic school in Alberta, uh, he was accused of sexually abusing boys. There was no criminal record ever made. Uh, he was accused again in 1891 and allowed to quietly resign. Complaints were often ignored. Uh, it wasn't until 1968 that the Indian Affairs in Canada began to take the knowledge more seriously and circulate a list of staff members to not to not be allowed to be rehired. Um, as of January 1st, 2015, very early on in the process for Canada, the claims of abuse sat at 37,951. Uh, Gorlier Hall in Inuvik uh, from eight, 1958 to 1979, there was never a year there where at least one supervisor was later convicted of sexually abusing um, students. And approximately 1,500, 150,000 first of children were sent to these residential schools, and at least 6,000 of the students died. Uh, there were questions about, well, what about in the United States? Um, and uh, Pratt uh, actually attempts to solve this. Um, well, early critics noted that Pratt attempted to solve this and noted that the high death rate of the students um, what was lowered artificially because Pratt very deliberately would send back any sick and dying student home so that they wouldn't die at the school, but they died at the communities, uh, further reducing um, any harm that might come in his fundraising. Uh, the students, they're, they're dying from a variety of things, including measles, influenza, mumps, tuberculosis, uh, trachoma, among other disease. And any of these uh, connections, when they're trying to write about it or, or tell their family, they were often censored by school officials. Um, it was, it became such an issue that the United States uh, 
uh, issued a report in 1928 called the Marion Report. It was conducted by the U.S. federal government on the state of American Indians, and they found, quote, the boarding schools are frankly supported in part by the laborer students. Those above a fourth grade ordinarily work for half a day and then go to school for half a day. The question may be very properly raised as to whether much of the work of Indian children in boarding schools would not be prohibited in many states by child labor laws. So I come back uh, to this United Nations uh, definition and we find the forcible transferring of children from one group uh, to another uh, as another portion of this definition uh, of, of genocide. We'll be coming to the last one in, in lectures uh, to come, but I wonder how to tie this together uh, with, with, the first, with the first lecture. And in that first lecture, I spoke uh, quite a bit uh, about this relationship, this tree relationship. And it was on the basis of, of this story of the woman who, who married the beaver and that you engaged in treaties on this mutual respect and this reciprocity uh, that you had a relationship with the land, but with all living creatures on that land and then between parties. The United States, as we see during the 19th century, seeks a complete shift on what that relationship looks like. They attempt to commodify the relationship. They attempt to commodify land and they make it a transactional relationship. What can you do uh, for me? But beyond that, we will not engage any further. Um, and then it shifts even more so by the time we hit the 1860s into a completely adversarial relationship. If you do not accept this culture, um, then you will be completely removed from it. And I think about the three steps of, of, of um, what, what scholars talk about, acculturation, assimilation, and forced assimilation. Acculturation might be you adapt to the dominant culture. You do so willingly out of, out of your, your freedom to do so. Assimilation um, in, in a similar uh, is is adapting into that culture. Uh, but the forced assimilation, uh, that is where you have no choice, where it is either you you die or you completely uh, adapt yourself in, into that space around you, which is precisely what Pratt is talking about in, in his viewpoints. He was so horrified by, by the warfare, that's why he starts these boarding schools, is that he would prefer to have an elimination of, of um, anything that is indigenous in order to save this individual. But I think noting our time, I should pause and um, see if there are clarifying questions this evening. From here, we'll be looking at um, a, a series of legal negotiations and the pushback uh, from the Dawes Act, which is going to uh, affect uh, those, those trees and, and reservations, all the way up to ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. And we'll be exploring how that Indian Child Welfare Act is coming out of, well, actions during the 50s and, and 60s of removal of child, children from home, but really has its roots from this boarding school and these, um, this warfare. Uh, that is occurring during the second half of the 19th century. But I'll pause here and, and I'm happy to, to talk more and, and hear about your questions. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask right now? There was, um, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me, Jacob? Yes. All right, okay. Um, there was something in the question and answer that said, um, I just wanted to share as a resource for after the presentation, the Minnesota author, Diane Wilson, excuse me, who wrote The Seed Keeper, has a nonfiction book called Spirit Car, Journey to a Dakota Past, where she explores her own family history. In this book, she covers many of the topics Dr. Juris has covered tonight. You familiar with that? I am. I think it's a, an excellent uh, suggestion. I'll, I'll also plug the Seed Keeper. I, I, I rather liked that that book. I thought it dealt uh, with contemporary issues in in a unique way. Um, but thank you, uh, whoever posted. I I really appreciate you uh, noting that as well. I'll note um, 
I think I had it in the suggested uh, readings, uh, Brenda Child's Boarding School Seasons uh, does a, a fabulous job of diving into some of the complexities uh, of this as well. Can you say that again so I can put that in the chat? Who did you say? I was reading Carol's method. Oh, that was a Brenda Child's Boarding School Seasons. And I can send the slides out. I think we sent them last time uh, mm -hmm. out, and that has some of the suggested readings as well. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Yes, Kate. Um, thanks. Um, I, I, uh, um, I, I'm curious about the recent decisions in the line three, Embridge line three, uh, so-called replacement case. Um, just um, there was some, a, a case that a part of that got litigated as to whether um, the treaty rights, whether there were treaty rights that would prevent um, the pipeline from going through um, what wasn't technically um, reservation land, but it was land that had been um, like the, the Mille Lacs Treaty, um, you know, where people were allowed to hunt and fish. Um, and and I'm just wondering if you're familiar with that at all, or if you know anything about what happened with that. Sure, I'm I'm not as familiar with the particular case. I am familiar with the treaty rights it, itself, and uh, the argument in part as it as I understood it is the pipeline potentially could disturb uh, wild rice beds uh, that might be outside of the reservation but are within ceded treaty lands. Mm -hmm. So those treaty lands are not uh, necessarily uh, restricted to reservation lands themselves. They can extend onto public lands that were ceded uh, because the Ojibwe retain all those rights. They never gave those rights up. So if a pipeline is cutting through and damages those uh, wild rice lands, the question is, is there an obligation of the federal government or the company to clean that up? Can they not do it at all? If the tribe says uh, you're going to damage these treaty rights and federal government, you need to step in and protect our, our treaty rights. The tribes are arguing, yes, of, of course, that that is what this treaty is, is for. Um, I think it's still up in the air with the courts. I don't think that there has. I, I imagine it's going to be appealed as far as they can go. I don't think this issue of line three is settled yet. Steph, you have your hand up. Yeah, okay. I have a question. A question. Uh, yes, thank you for this really informative uh, presentation. It's amazing. Um, I, I have a question. My family settled in northern Minnesota in 1883, and I recently came across <laughs> some postcards of the boarding school, the Indian boarding school up near Tower. And I was wondering why would they have postcard? I mean, what what was the and and I haven't I need to go back and look, but wh what was the thought in the communities around these boarding schools? Was it a point of pride to have a boarding school? I mean, was it like a a tourist destination. I mean, w would people have been, it just is, I haven't been able to really look at the, look much at these photos because they're disturbing to me. And um just curious what you think about that. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to know a little bit more. I haven't heard about uh, the postcards, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, much of the material that I know of are letters and these photographs that are being sent to donors uh, to demonstrate the progress that's happening at the schools or the quote okay. progress that's at these schools in order to see to to show this is a net good for the community hmm. um my thought is it probably varies by individual to individual uh, about whether individuals knew a school was there but also, well, yeah, it's it's a training school. Maybe you have a child who comes out uh, on the farm and helps you for one summer. Um, some people treated these students very well in, in their homes. You're part of the family. Okay. Others, you're an indentured servant uh, of sorts who are here for the summer and we won't think about you uh, beyond that. That would, that would be my impression uh, of what's going on in, in your area is it's going to be a very case by case aspect. 
there wasn't a, a revulsion of horror from the communities. I mean, people thought these were a net benefit overall for, for a community. Point of pride, they probably weren't really thinking about it in, in any case. Hmm. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything they would like to say? I was just looking up the date of your next presentation because I don't have it on the top of my head. Do you? Did you say the date? Because I lost internet there for a little bit. I think it is a Wednesday in November. I thought it was the 9th. Let me <laughs> okay. look to be sure. The 8th, I, I believe. November 8th is the Wednesday. Okay, I'm looking my myself right now. Okay, well, if you know that that is the case, then everyone... We welcome you back on November 8th. Um, and uh, if there's nothing else, then we'll let you all get back off to your your evening. But thank you very much, um, Dr. Juris. It was very interesting and heartbreaking at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I will uh, look forward to hearing you again next month. It, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to take in. It I is agree. a lot. Um, so feel free to uh, reach out if you'd like to continue the conversations. I do have uh, my my email here. I'm happy to talk about additional resources. I'll, I'll type it into the chat before we go. Um, Thank you uh, again, uh, because uh, as I said, this this affects us in different ways in in different times. Um, the story doesn't end here. It doesn't end for for all all the children here. Uh, and we'll get to that in, in the next lecture. We'll try to tie uh, some of this together because it's it's a whole arching narrative in, in, in our region. And different individuals will have different experiences with the boarding schools. It, it's a very long, long history. But I think it's important to see that they were seen as this positive good, especially coming out of events like Wounded Knee or the Sandy Lake tragedy. It was, it was an argue, argument that we can certainly disagree with and there are individuals who are pushing back against it, and namely the children and the families, um, but the philosophy behind them was was one of um, of a net good. Um, I think it's un unfortunate uh, looking back uh, on it, but that that is what happened here. <laughs>